Ads heard during the podcast that are not in my voice are placed by third-party agencies outside of my control and should not imply an endorsement by Weird Darkness or myself. Stories and content in Weird Darkness can be disturbing for some listeners and is intended for mature audiences only. Parental discretion is strongly advised. In one area, a man who saw the flames coming toward him cut his throat rather than be burned to death. He was rescued before the fire reached him, but he soon died of his injuries. In another section, very near to where the fire started, rescuers had nearly succeeded in freeing a woman where the fire swept through. She had survived the collapse, only to be consumed by the fire. As the fire spread, rescue volunteers, firemen, friends, and family were forced back by the extreme heat. Fire crews poured a steady stream of water on the burning section, seeking to halt the spread of flames while rescues continued on the other side. But it was a losing battle. The fire soon spread across the entire ruin, and the terrified screams of those still trapped inside were quickly silenced, with only the sounds of the fire remaining. 14 people were known to have burned to death in the sight of their friends and families. Welcome, Weirdos! I'm Darren Marlar, and this is Weird Darkness. Here you'll find stories of the paranormal, supernatural, legends, lore, the strange and bizarre, crime, conspiracy, mysterious, macabre, unsolved, and unexplained. Coming up in this episode… The Ghost of a Man in Grey Haunts a London Theater The Boogeyman – Where did he come from and is he based on a real person? A disaster that took place at the Pemberton Mill on January 10, 1860, a disaster that left a community and a nation stunned. A night of children telling scary stories to each other turns into the real thing. A young girl bumps into her father in the hallway, which is impossible as her father isn't home. James Bond 007 himself tells his own personal story of the paranormal. Sir Roger Moore tells of his terrifying experience. A young teen girl wakes up in the dark of night being choked by a red-eyed being. Friends hear a crash in the kitchen, and though everything appears normal, what they eventually find is the stuff of nightmares. The discovery of a body in the local river leaves one town with a gruesome mystery and possibly the framing of an innocent man for the murder. Known to the outside world as the City of the Dead, Dargovs is a truly remarkable and mysterious place that we know little about. Do you ever get the feeling that you're being watched or that someone is following you? Perhaps it's not your imagination. A father in South Yorkshire claims his family's being haunted by the ghost of an old lady. Two men, a forest, and a Ouija board. Will that be enough to find a rumored black-eyed child that's been seen there? What appears to be a poltergeist continues to torment office colleagues, or is it just being playful? And later, I'll share an original creepypasta from a weirdo family member. It's a story called Amoeba. If you're new here, welcome to the show. While you're listening, be sure to check out WeirdDarkness.com for merchandise, my newsletter, Twitter contests, to connect with me on social media. Plus, you can visit the Hope in the Darkness page if you're struggling with depression or dark thoughts. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. Now, bolt your doors, lock your windows, turn off your lights, and come with me into the weird darkness. The Drury Lane Theatre in London is possibly the most haunted theatre in the UK. The most famous ghost is the one called the Man in Grey. He appears in full costume, wearing a tri-cornered hat, a powdered wig, and a long gray cloak 
with the hilt of a sword protruding from it. He is said to be the ghost of a man whose skeletal remains were found in 1848. A knife had penetrated his long gray cloak and was still embedded in his ribcage. He always appears during the daytime to actors when they are rehearsing. He is thought to be a recordings ghost, as he is always seen in the same place, walking quietly in the same direction. His ghostly visitations are thought to be lucky, but the plays performed after his appearance always do well at the box office. During renovation work at the theater in the late 1970s, builders found a buried skeleton clad in the remains of a gray riding coat and a knife sticking out of its ribs. It is believed this may be the remains of the young man, for whom a body was never located. Another ghost reported at the theater described as tall, thin, and ugly is thought to be the ghost of a grumpy actor named Charles Macklin. In 1735, Charles killed his fellow actor Thomas Hallam in an argument over a wig. He thrust his cane through Hallam's left eye into his brain. Macklin has often been seen backstage, wandering the corridor where the murder was committed. The ghost of comedian Joe McGraldy, who gave his farewell performance at Drury Lane, is a rather helpful apparition that is often felt rather than seen. He is said to guide nervous actors gently about the stage. In 1948, a young American actress named Betty Jo Jones was performing badly during a run of Oklahoma. Then, as she describes it, she felt invisible hands guiding her into a different position on the stage. They continued to guide her around the stage during the rest of the performance. Her performance was later described as flawless. Also seen on stage were the ghosts of King Charles II and a crowd of his attendants. Another young actress named Doreen Duke felt the same invisible hands while trying out for a part in The King and I. She got the part, hands down. She believed that Joe Grimaldi's ghost was helping her here. The comedian Stanley Lupino was in his dressing room applying his makeup when, looking in the mirror, along with his own reflection, he saw another face looking back at him. It was the face of Dan Leno, another comedian who had died recently. Lupino was told that he was using Leno's favorite dressing room. A woman in the audience saw what was probably a ghost watching the play that was being performed. She described this apparition as a man wearing old-fashioned clothes sitting at the end of the row where I was sitting. When the lights went up, the man was gone. Later, whilst perusing a book on the history of the theater, she saw a picture of Charles Keene, a 19th century actor. She instantly recognized him as the ghost that she had seen earlier. Considering all these reports of hauntings, you could say that the Drury Lane Theater is where actors, both past and present, take center stage. No exploration into the world of urban legends would be complete without a look at the one that started them all, the Boogeyman. He exists everywhere and nowhere. He's under the bed, hiding in the closet or waiting just outside the window for parents to leave the room so he can feast on their fat, juicy children. The Boogeyman legend is as old as time. In every corner of the globe and in nearly every culture, there is some version of the boogeyman. He is eternal. He is that thing in the darkness that we dare not speak of. He is your worst nightmare 
come to life. It is nearly impossible to say for sure when and where the boogeyman originated. He was surely conjured up as a tool to get children to mind their parents or else the boogeyman would get them. Many a parent has used this legend when all else fails. Don't stay out past your curfew or the boogeyman will be waiting for you, they will say. Or do as I say or I'll sick the boogeyman on you. So who is the boogeyman? He is whatever scares you the most. If you're frightened of demons, that's who he is for you. If bears terrify you, he will come to you in the form of a bear. The worst thing your mind can conjure is exactly how he will appear to you. Sometimes the boogeyman is just a dark shape passing through a room. At other times, he is eyes that stare out from a crack in a closet door. Every kid knows that the boogeyman can be anywhere. That is why you have to keep the covers pulled up around your neck, and whatever you do, don't let your legs dangle off the side of the bed. That's just asking for the boogeyman to drag you off to some place far away where no one will hear your screams. As scary as all of the boogeyman stories are, they are just fantasy, at least up to a point. There have certainly been many cases over the years of real-life boogeymen who have done things more terrifying than any make-believe monster ever could. One of those monsters was a man named Tommy Lynn Sells. Sells was executed by the state of Texas in 2014 for the brutal murder of 13-year-old Kayleen Harris. He was every parent's worst nightmare, a devil in human form who preyed upon the most innocent of victims. Sells was thought to have been responsible for the murders of at least 22 men, women, and children. It wasn't until the attack on young Kayleen and her friend Crystal Surlis that Sells' reign of terror finally ended. The killer had been an acquaintance of Kayleen's parents. When they met him at a community church event, he was down on his luck, and being good people, they tried to help him in any way they could. They couldn't know that their kindness would be repaid with more heartache than they imagined possible. It was on New Year's Eve, 1999, that the family saw what the real Tommy Lynn Sells was capable of. As Kayleen and Crystal were sleeping peacefully in Kayleen's bunk beds, Sells crept into the room and began to viciously attack the 13-year-old. Awakened by the violence taking place in the bed below hers, 10-year-old Crystal watched helplessly as her friend was stabbed multiple times. When Sells was finished with Kayleen, he turned his attention to Crystal, slicing the child across the throat. Thinking that both girls were dead, Sells fled the scene. Young Crystal, though critically wounded, managed to escape from the home and make it to a neighbor's house. They immediately called police and the search for the maniac who attacked the girls was set into motion. Kayleen did not survive the horrifying attack, but Crystal did, and she remembered everything. With her help, a forensic artist was able to draw a sketch of what the killer looked like. Before long, authorities had their man, one Tommy Lynn Sells. Sells admitted to killing Kayleen and attempting to murder Crystal. He didn't stop there. He confessed to murders all over the country, as well as other unspeakable crimes. He was the devil incarnate for anyone unfortunate enough to encounter him when he was on a crime spree. Still recovering from the injuries that had nearly killed her, Crystal testified against Sells at his murder trial. He was convicted of the murder of Kayleen and the attempted murder of Crystal. He received the ultimate punishment, death by lethal injection. Crystal's nightmare was finally over. This boogeyman would never hurt her or anyone else ever again.
There are also boogeymen who are the products of the worldwide communication highway, the Internet. The most famous or infamous of those has to be Slender Man. Slender Man began innocently enough as an Internet meme. Not long after his creation, various websites started inviting users to send in their own Slender Man stories. People from all over the world began to make up scary tales about Slender Man. In many of the fictionalized accounts, Slender Man was a nameless, faceless entity who stalked and sometimes murdered unsuspecting victims. He was usually portrayed as very tall and thin with abnormally long limbs. Video games and even film shorts have been developed with Slender Man as their central character. He has become a phenomenon very popular with teens and adults alike. As with anything that becomes as well-known as Slender Man, some people took it too seriously, with dire consequences. In May of 2014, two 12-year-old girls in Wisconsin invited a mutual friend over for a sleepover. The friend had spent time at the home of one of the girls before, and they were good friends. She had no reason to think that this night would be any different she couldn't have been more wrong. The two girls who had suggested the sleepover had a plan. They were going to isolate the third girl and then, when the time was right, kill her. They weren't angry with the girl. In fact, they had no problems with her whatsoever. Allegedly, they wanted to kill their friend to prove to Slender Man that they were worthy to be his disciples. The girls had followed the exploits of Slender Man online and believed him to be real. They thought that he lived in the woods somewhere close by. They intended to murder their friend and then find his house so they could reveal to him what they had done. Once the two girls had the third girl alone, one of them is said to have held her down while the other one stabbed her. Thinking they had accomplished their mission, they left the girl's body in the woods and set out looking for Slender Man. A passing bicyclist happened upon the girl who had been so brutally attacked by those she thought were her friends. The girl had been stabbed over a dozen times, but she was still alive and was even able to identify her assailants. The two would-be killers were quickly apprehended. Their alleged victim is still recovering both physically and emotionally from what happened to her that day when her friends turned on her, and all for a boogeyman who existed only in their minds. The boogeyman of the past is a creature from the land of make-believe whose original purpose was to get kids to walk the straight and narrow and mind their elders. That doesn't mean that there aren't plenty of things that go bump in the night to be fearful of, like the cold-blooded killer who unleashed his rage on two young girls one dark Texas night. Boogeymen are all around us. Usually, we don't even realize how close we've come to danger until it has already passed us by. The next time you feel a shiver for no reason or goose flesh suddenly appears on your arms, that might just be something trying to tell you that evil is closer than you think. Coming up, a disaster that took place at the Pemberton Mill on January 10, 1860, a disaster that left a community and a nation stunned. That story when Weird Darkness returns. I'm a man of habits. Okay, truth be told, my bride says I'm boring. I like the same stuff, and that's what I stick with, and that includes what I eat. Even for breakfast, I used to opt for leftover pizza, hot dogs, hamburgers. Uh, did, did I mention pizza? Anyway, now that I'm trying to lose weight and cut back on the carbs, I've had to make changes for breakfast. Now, instead of a big, heavy breakfast, 
I just grabbed one of my Built Bars, the best tasting protein bar on the planet. Built Bars satisfy my hunger with up to 19 grams of protein and also satisfy my sugar craving despite being less than 3 grams of sugar. And at only about 150 calories per bar, if I'm really hungry in the morning, I can grab two of them and still feel good about it. Try replacing your dessert or even a meal like breakfast with a Built Bar. You won't even know it's not really a candy bar. Visit WeirdDarkness.com slash Built and build a box of your own. Use the promo code Weird Darkness at checkout and get 10% off your entire purchase. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash built promo code Weird Darkness. All too often, we hear about an accident or event somewhere that resulted in almost unimaginable tragedy and loss of life. Yet there are even more stories where an accident occurs but tragedy is averted by the slimmest chance. In those cases, there remains that haunting codicil, what if? What if it happened 15 minutes earlier or 15 minutes later? What if it had been a weekday or what if it had been a weekend? We hear of an elementary school that was struck by a tornado just minutes after the last child had left for the day, or a church that was flattened an hour before it would have been full for Sunday services, or the mine explosion on a holiday that kept many miners at home. There is the train that falls into a ravine shortly after most of the passengers have disembarked. How many times have you heard of a natural gas leak causing a house to explode, but no one was home at the time? The disaster that took place at the Pemberton Mill on January 10, 1860 was truly such a tragedy that fits into each of these categories, but with a twist. There occurred a terrible disaster that resulted in an impossibly small loss of life, followed by a second disaster that left a community and a nation stunned. Lawrence, Massachusetts was a city founded to promote the growing textile industry. The land that was to become the site for the new city was purchased in 1845 by a group of Boston industrialists with the intention of bringing in textile mills. The location was perfect for this purpose. It was on the Merrimack River, a great amount of water was required to run the mills. It was just a short train ride from Boston, and it was downriver from Lowell. The city of Lowell had been founded 20 years earlier and was already the largest textile producer in the U.S. The Boston investors were certain that they could capitalize on the growing demand for manufactured textiles and the already established industries in the area. There was another advantage to the location – a huge labor force that was ready, willing, and able. For years, men had been traveling to Europe encouraging immigration to the New England states by guaranteeing employment and housing. As ships arrived in New York and Boston harbors, there were wagons waiting to take the immigrants straight to the textile mills. In some cases, these newcomers to America's shores were on a ship one day and operating a loom the next. Their ranks included men, women, and children. It was a sad fact that children as young as eight years old were employed in the mills. The new city, to be named Lawrence after Congressman Abbott Lawrence, one of the initial investors, would simply tap into the already established pipeline of workers. Unbeknownst to the mill owners, they were about to get a great boom in the labor market. The Great Famine, better known in America as the Irish Potato Famine, was a time of mass starvation and disease in Ireland. Between 1845 and 1852, over a million Irish people died 
and another million immigrated mainly to the U.S., where jobs awaited them in the textile mills. The Boston inventors were exactly correct in their plans. Lawrence did indeed become a major player in textiles. The city was incorporated in 1853, and within a few years, several very large mills had been built and work was underway. Several tenements had been built along with the mills since the city was brand new and the factory workers would need housing as soon as they arrived so they could get right to work. It all seemed too good to be true. Business was booming and by 1860, only seven years after it was founded, Lawrence had a population of over 17,000. It had been nicknamed Immigrant City, employing workers from almost every country in Europe and French Canadians as well. The dreams of the Boston investors had come true in ways they probably hadn't dared to imagine, but not so for the immigrants. True, they had received what they had been promised, but it wasn't really what they had expected. Almost anyone who wanted a job could easily get one. The mills needed as many unskilled workers as they did those with specialized training. They worked 65 hours per week, and the vast majority of workers, called operatives, earned about 40 cents a day, for a total of about $2 per week. At those wages, a head of household couldn't possibly earn enough to support his or her family, so entire families had to work in the mills. The single largest group in the textile labor force was women, and usually young women. The largest employer in Lawrence was the American Woolen Company. Over half of their operatives were girls between 14 and 18. Many children accompanied their parents and older siblings into the mills, some as young as eight, but most companies shied away from hiring children that young, preferring to wait till they were at least 10. Women and children could do much of the work, and it was expected that they would be paid less than the men. It was a sound business practice for increasing profits. Housing was another one of the promises made to immigrants when they were being enticed to come and work. This promise, too, was kept, though again, very likely not as the immigrants envisioned. Lawrence operatives and their families lived in overcrowded and dangerous tenement buildings. Frequently, several families had to share a single apartment as wages were low and rent was high. It was the only way they could afford to keep a roof over their heads. Food was expensive, too. The main staples were bread, molasses, and beans. Meat was costly and was usually reserved for holidays. The working and living conditions did not allow for a healthy workforce. The mills were terribly dangerous, especially for the children. It was not unheard of for an operative to be terribly injured, perhaps losing a hand or arm in a loom. The procedure was to escort the injured outside where they would wait in hopes that they did not bleed to death until a friend or family member would find them and take them home. Workplace injuries, along with disease and malnutrition, took a very high toll. A child in Lawrence or one of the other mill towns had only a 50% chance of surviving past the age of six. Life expectancy wasn't much better for the adults. Of those who worked in a textile mill, 36 out of every 100 men and women died before reaching the ripe old age of 25. In 1853, John Lowell and his brother-in-law, J. Pickering Putnam, decided to go into the textile business. They hired an engineer named Charles H. Bigelow to construct a large building that would house the most modern textile equipment available. Their new Pemberton Mill, a cotton spinning mill met their expectations and then some. The building was five stories high with a basement and measured 280 feet long and 84 feet wide, giving them roughly 141,000 square feet of workspace. The building and equipment cost a previously unheard of amount of $850,000. Several hundred operatives were hired and Lowell and Putnam were in business. After only four years, Lowell and Putnam lost their nerve during a financial panic in 1857. They sold Pemberton Mill to George Howe and David Nevins, Sr. 
for a substantial loss. The new owners moved in more equipment and hired more operatives to increase the output. The mill operated with great success and earned the owners an average of $1.5 million each year. The building was so packed with machines and workers that it was said to vibrate with energy. Based on what was to come, that vibration was more than likely literal rather than figurative, as over 1,000 people toiled there, running 2,700 spindles and 700 looms. The industrial area where the Pemberton Mill was located had several working textile mills situated side by side along the Merrimack River. There were thousands of operatives going to and from work at the same times each day. The area was terribly congested with buildings and people and buildings filled with people. Looking back, it was a disaster waiting to happen. And so it was. On Tuesday, January 10, 1860, at a few minutes before five in the afternoon, there were many people on hand to witness what was to be the single worst industrial accident in Massachusetts and one of the worst in U.S. history. People outside and inside the Pemberton Mill building were startled when, as described in American Heritage magazine, suddenly there was a sharp rattle and then a prolonged, deafening crash. A section of the building's brick wall seemed to bulge out and explode, and then, literally in seconds, the Pemberton collapsed. Tons of machinery crashed down through the crumpling floors, dragging trapped, screaming victims along in their downward path. The factory was a heap of twisted iron, splintered beams, pulverized bricks, and agonized, imprisoned human flesh. Workers from neighboring mills could do nothing but watch in horror and disbelief as the entire Pemberton building, all five stories, collapsed before their eyes. The air was rent by screams of the operatives trapped inside the ruins. Where there was once a huge industrial building was now a pile of rubble under a huge plume of dust. Nothing remained except a section of an exterior rear wall. Everything else was gone, reduced to a massive pile of rubble. Cries for help filled the air as workers in nearby mills rushed to the scene. Somewhere between 800 and 900 people had been in the building when it collapsed. To the utter amazement of the witnesses, living, breathing people began crawling out of the rubble. A few hundred people were either unhurt or had only minor injuries and were able to pull themselves from the wreckage. With a catastrophic event, that should have meant certain death for almost everyone in the building, there were survivors, many survivors. In fact, other than a few dozen who had died instantly, almost everyone in the building survived the collapse, even after falling several stories as the floors fell from beneath their feet. Iron columns had crumbled, massive beams had been splintered, and many tons of brick and mortar lay in heaps, but somehow, many, many people were still alive. Witnesses believed it was nothing short of a miracle. As the dust began to settle, more than 600 workers were still held captive in the tangled, twisted ruins. Some were merely trapped. Some had minor or at least survivable wounds, and still others were still breathing but had sustained substantial injuries. George Howe, one of the owners, had escaped as the structure was falling. His partner David Nevins was away from the building when it fell. Apparently, the large and heavy machinery inside the building that had helped cause the collapse also helped protect the workers inside. Those who were able to avoid being crushed by the falling machines were, in turn, protected by them as they created safe pockets of space while holding up the timbers and other debris. In some cases, as many as 25 people survived by huddling in the same protected space. One woman who was standing near a window along the wall that remained standing became so frightened that she threw her bonnet and shawl out the window and then jumped out herself. She soon died from injuries sustained from her dramatic leap. 
While many people were able to free themselves from the wreckage, it took Herculean efforts to free others. Workers from nearby mills and the surrounding community ran to the aid of the victims. Every able-bodied person pitched in, working at a breakneck pace to free trapped people as quickly as they could. Friends and family members arrived on the scene and began a frantic search for their loved ones. A general alarm had gone out to the Lawrence Fire Department and to those in the surrounding towns. When the firefighters arrived, they climbed down and went to work with the rescue effort. There were many tales of daring escapes, remarkable rescues, and unbelievable recoveries. A group of men heard a young girl screaming and crying for help. She was found covered by at least 10 feet of rubble and debris. After working to remove the twisted mass from on top of her, the rescuers were shocked when the girl jumped up, unhurt and smiling, thanked them for freeing her, and ran off to find her family. In another part of the ruins, a family of five was released from their tomb unharmed when a large section of floor was lifted from above them. They climbed from the hole, the terrified mother scooped her children to her, and praising their rescuers cried out a prayer of thanks. Another miraculous escape was that of Selena Weeks. Miss Weeks had been working in the fifth floor spool room and dropped with it when the building fell. As she regained her senses, she realized that she was still standing on the spool room floor, but was waist deep in debris. She was able to dig her way out and made her way home unharmed. At the same time that Miss Weeks fell from the top floor, Damon Wyham was working in the basement. He found himself completely buried under a dozen feet of debris. After repeated tries, he was able to tunnel his way to an area where rescuers could reach him and he was pulled to safety. A small boy who was working on one of the upper floors realized what was happening when he heard the crashes. He jumped into a trash can and rode down with the floor, becoming buried under several feet of wreckage. When rescuers lifted the material from what contemporary reports described as his safety capsule, he jumped out and walked away as if nothing had happened. Three young sisters with the appropriate surname of Luck all survived. Jane Luck was buried for nearly five hours but was released unharmed. Her sister Anna Luck heard the crashing as the building collapsed and dove under her loom. She called to her other sister and friend to do the same. All three of the girls survived. Not all of the Luck family was as lucky. The girl's two uncles, who were working in the mill, were killed. Thomas Watson was on the fifth floor when it fell. His jaw was broken in three places and he sustained three broken ribs and several deep cuts. Despite his injuries, he climbed out from the rubble unaided. He noticed to his surprise that he had not felt any pain until he was walking about free. His wife also worked at the mill, but that day she had stayed home for the first time since she had started work six months before. It so happened that Watson was to leave on a trip the next day and she had stayed home to prepare his traveling clothes and pack his things. A child was found pinned under a large iron pillar by a rescue team lying next to a woman. The following is a contemporary description of the dramatic events that followed. On Tuesday evening, while 2,000 men were exerting every energy in rescuing the survivors from their living sepulchers and the dead from the rubbish which buried them, a party came upon the body of a little girl. She lay apparently crushed beneath a ponderous block of iron weighing over a thousand pounds and which covered her body to the chin. Her back was pressed against a huge timber. One of her arms was thrust to the elbow through a ring in a piece of machinery and she was completely wedged in by heavy iron gearing. Intent only on preserving her features and form as little disfigured as possible, the men labored carefully to remove the block of iron without crushing her still further. Four of them tugged upon it and succeeded in loosening it. The other rubbish was then removed and the body taken out when, what was the surprise and joy of the men to find that they had rescued a living girl instead of a corpse, and more, that her injuries were not fatal but comparatively trifling. The heavy iron 
had met with some more powerful obstruction than her body, and her life was spared as if by a miracle. The body of the woman lying next to her was extricated from the ruins by her friends and relatives. The bricks and iron had buried her so tightly that there were no hopes of her survival. When her body was at last drawn out, the circle of friends found their worst fears confirmed. Her husband took her carefully in his arms and bore her toward his home. A number of relatives were there waiting. Suddenly, the woman revived and, throwing up her hand, cried out, I'm safe, I'm safe. She was received as one risen from the dead. Henry Neese was both victim and hero. He was working in the boiler room when the building fell. As rubble began to fall on him, he rushed for the door and fell out onto the porch where debris piled onto him. After being nearly suffocated by a cloud of steam and dust, he was able to burrow through to safety, but instead of leaving, he began a search of the area. He found a young girl whose arms and legs were injured, pinned to the floor by a beam across her neck. He found a saw and cut her free, passing her off to a rescue team as he continued to search for survivors. Then he located a friend of his, lying over a young woman who was pinned under a mass of wreckage. The woman urged Nice to free the man first, as she was not as badly injured. After the man was removed, a team worked feverishly trying to remove a heavy piece of machinery from over her, but they were unable to free her. They planned to come back later with tools, but after the second disaster of the night befell them, she was killed where she lay. In another area, a man named Adams was trapped in the basement by several heavy beams. Because of the precarious position of the beams relative to where he was trapped, rescuers were unable to reach him, but instead passed him an axe and a saw. With these tools, he was able to cut and chop his way to freedom. Dramatic rescue efforts continued throughout the site, with person after person being pulled from the wreckage. The Lawrence City Hall had been prepared for double duty as a makeshift morgue and as a hospital. As the dead were removed, they were carefully carried to the dead room. When the injured were removed, they were taken to the hospital room in the same building. It was a cold January day, but the rescuers stayed warm with exertion. Soon it began to grow dark and colder. Large bonfires were built in a circle around the collapsed building to provide light for the rescuers as they continued their search into the darkness. At about 9.30 that night, after four and a half hours and hundreds of people freed from the wreckage, someone either kicked over or dropped an oil lamp. The burning fluid quickly spread to a pile of debris. The flames shot across the splintered wood and wads of cotton, some soaked with oil, and quickly ignited the ruins of the building where many trapped but living people were waiting to be released. The second disaster of the day had begun. In one area, a man who saw the flames coming toward him cut his throat rather than be burned to death. He was rescued before the fire reached him, but he soon died of his injuries. In another section, very near to where the fire started, Rescuers had nearly succeeded in freeing a woman where the fire swept through. She had survived the collapse, only to be consumed by the fire. As the fire spread, rescue volunteers, firemen, friends, and family were forced back by the extreme heat. Fire crews poured a steady stream of water on the burning section, seeking to halt the spread of flames while rescues continued on the other side. But it was a losing battle. The fire soon spread across the entire ruin, and the terrified screams of those still trapped inside were quickly silenced, with only the sounds of the fire remaining. Fourteen people were known to have burned to death in the sight of their friends and families. The fire burned long and hot, raging through the night and into the next day, Wednesday, January 11th there was little that anyone could do but stand back and watch. 
Anyone who had been left alive after the collapse was now dead, ravaged by fire. By evening, the fire had mostly burned itself out, but too much heat was radiating from the wreckage for anyone to approach. During the day on Wednesday, a crowd had begun to form. Flocks of people from other towns and cities, including Boston, began arriving by train. They filled every available inch of space they could find, filling the streets and lining the bridge over the Merrimack. They had come to see the wreckage of the once thriving factory. They wanted to be a part of history, to be able to say that they had been there to see what was left after the great building had collapsed. As the day drew on, a light rain had begun to fall, later turning to snow. The Pemberton Mill Company took over the ruins. From here on, company men would be directing the efforts as rescue had become recovery. By 10 o'clock Thursday morning, January 12, the fire was almost completely out, but smoke continued to bellow up from deep inside the rubble. The firefighters continued to pour streams of water where they saw smoke. It was still too hot to enter the wreckage, so recovery efforts had to be put off another day. The smoke and cold didn't seem to deter the crowds of the morbidly curious. They would have to wait another day to see flesh and bone released from the ashes. As snow continued to fall, it drifted down through the burned-out beams and machinery, falling gently onto the upraised faces of charred corpses who patiently waited to be released from their tomb and taken to their families. On Friday morning, January 13, the pit had cooled enough for the recovery efforts to continue. Derricks were set up around the ruin to help lift and remove heavy machinery and debris. Victims were once again being removed, but this time none were among the living. The recovery was now more dangerous, but the 100 men working there were determined that no one would be left in that miserable pit. The crowd continued to look on, but a few of the men left the safety of the road and stepped inside the perimeter, adding themselves to the recovery operation. At one point, as groups of two and three worked their way through the wreckage, a man remembered where he had seen a young woman named Kate Cooney partially buried. She had been struck by a beam and her legs were pinned under her so she couldn't move. It had been just before the fire found her that he had heard her cries for help. The men dug in the area the man indicated and they soon came upon her body. She had been badly burned about her head and neck and her arms had been burned off up to her elbows, but her lower body was relatively untouched. Her skirt and apron were not even scorched. Thirteen more bodies were pulled out on Saturday the 14th. As before, some were only partially burned, some were completely charred, and others were found with only portions of limbs remaining to indicate that a human body had once lain in that spot. As darkness approached, the men stopped working as they did not want to further mutilate by accident any bodies they might find in the darkness. They made every effort to get everybody identified and returned to the people who loved them. On Sunday the 15th, over 150 men arrived for work at sunrise and the search continued. They did not wish to cause any more grief than was absolutely necessary for the families that were still waiting for someone to be pulled out of the rubble. They chose to work through their one day of rest. On January 20, ten days after the building had collapsed, the last bodies were recovered from the debris. These bodies were completely unrecognizable. They were taken to the dead room at the city hall even though no one there would be able to claim them. In the end, 13 bodies had been charred and mutilated beyond any possibility of identification. A little more than two months after the disaster, the city purchased a plot in Lawrence's Bellevue Cemetery and on Sunday, March 4, 1869, funeral services were held and the remains of the unknown workers were laid to rest. Later, a monument was placed at the head of the plot in memory of all who lost their lives in Pemberton Mill. The crowds remained at the disaster site for many days after the last body had been removed. It was as if they just couldn't move on. 
soon people began to wander onto the site and started sifting through the debris, searching for relics or mementos of the disaster. A man from St. Louis collected a large bundle of grisly souvenirs that included burned clothing from some of the victims. Two New Yorkers collected pieces of broken bricks and splinters of burned beams. The ferocity with which the relic seekers went about their business was becoming a hazard to the cleanup crews and the intruders alike. Eventually, realizing it had to stop, the mayor and the company gave orders for it to stop and hired men to guard the ruins. Eventually, the crowds dispersed and went home. Calls went out across the country for financial assistance. The New England Society of Manufacturers collected a total of $19,000 and handed it over to Mayor Daniel Saunders. Boston clubs and societies brought in another $9,000. Churches, schools, and fraternal organizations collected donations from around the country, raising the total of $65,579.29. Mayor Saunders put together a committee to determine how best to use the money to assist the victims. Hearings were held to investigate the cause of the collapse and to determine fault. After several days of testimony, the blame was laid at the door of engineer Charles Bigelow. The primary problems with the building lay in faulty or otherwise substandard materials. The iron pillars that had been put in place to support the heavy machinery were found to be brittle and badly cast. In a moment of stress, they had crumbled. It was also determined that the mortar used with the bricks was extremely poor and was completely ineffective at holding the brick joints together. The committee felt that the use of appropriate materials and construction systems should have been Bigelow's responsibility and that his design must somehow be at fault as well. The committee failed to take into account that most of the other mill buildings in Lawrence had also been designed and built by Bigelow. They also ignored the fact that the mill's second owners had severely overloaded the structure well beyond its design limits. No blame was assigned to the owners, since they obviously had purchased a faulty building without knowledge of its shortcomings. Some of the final statistics were startling. Women and girls made up 62% of the mill's workforce, but they made up 73% of the dead and missing, and 67% of the injured, leaving questions of how these proportions became so out of balance. After the dead and the living had been counted, and counted again, it was believed that of the 1,003 employees at the Pemberton Mill, between 99 and 145 people lost their lives in the disaster. The best estimate as to those injured is 302. All of these numbers are horrifying and unfortunate, but the most remarkable thing of all is that while a five-story building suffered a catastrophic collapse into rubble in a matter of seconds, nearly 600 people either climbed out or were pulled free of the wreckage without injury and were able to walk home on their own. After all the bodies had been recovered, the company called in those who were unemployed as a result of the disaster and hired them to work on the cleanup crews. When all the wreckage had been removed, the owners rebuilt a new mill on the old foundation and reopened for business. For a long time after the second Pemberton Mill was opened, workers reported seeing people they didn't recognize walking through a room or down an aisle. The employee might turn a corner and catch a glimpse of a mysterious person wearing old-fashioned clothes who suddenly vanished. It didn't take long for the living workers to suspect that they were sharing their workspace with people who were long since dead. Over time, fewer and fewer people spoke about seeing these spectral workers in the mill. It is impossible to determine if they were appearing less frequently or if the living had grown so accustomed to their ethereal comrades that they no longer noticed when they were around. The mill has long been closed down, but the building still stands on the bank of the Merrimack River. There is talk of turning it into loft-style condominiums or possibly a shopping center. It will be interesting to see if any of the future occupants of the old Pemberton Mill building turn a corner one day 
and come face to face with a woman in a floor-length skirt and long apron looking for her machine in order to spin cotton into yet another century. When Weird Darkness returns, a night of children telling scary stories to each other turns into the real thing. Plus, a young girl bumps into her father in the hallway, which is impossible as her father isn't home. James Bond, 007 Roger Moore himself, tells his own personal paranormal story. Also, the discovery of a body in the local river leaves one town with a gruesome mystery and possibly the framing of an innocent man for the murder. These stories and more coming up. Remember staying up late on a Friday or Saturday night, either at home or at a friend's house, and watching your local TV station's horror host presenting a terrible B-movie with aliens, monsters, ghosts, alien monster ghosts, vampires, werewolves, and all other kinds of crazy, creepy characters? Those were fun nights, weren't they? Well, that's what the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com has to offer – all day, every day. Thanks to our friends at the Monster Channel, you can visit WeirdDarkness.com slash watch party right after listening to this episode and immediately be entertained by a horror host and horrible movie – or should I say, horror movie. And not only can you watch the B-movies and horror hosts streaming there 24-7, but once a month we all gather together to watch a movie and talk about it in the chat room on that same page. Get your frights and funnies on the Weirdo Watch Party page at WeirdDarkness.com. This will be the first time I have submitted a paranormal story of any kind to a website. Several strange things have happened to me during my life. This was the first incident. It took place when I was around six or seven years old. We lived in the middle of nowhere with our grandmother. Our father was a traveling salesman and we rarely saw him. On one particular night we were all in bed and shared the same room. I decided it would be fun to try and scare my brother and sister by telling them spooky stories. Well, they got freaked out, and our grandmother came in upset at all the noise we were making. She could hear us downstairs. She told us to go to sleep and stop making noise. I was starting to fall asleep when I heard what sounded like muffled coughing coming from the other side of the room. Hearing the coughing, I was awake. I tried to go back to sleep and then suddenly I heard whispering. I knew that my siblings were asleep, so I was confused as to where this whispering was coming from. There was literally nobody else in the house except my brothers, sisters, and grandma. I started to understand the whispers, something like, go home. I don't know why I did this, but I got up and decided to turn on the light, and nothing was in the room with us. I looked everywhere after that. I didn't find anybody. I was extremely freaked out by this, so I went in the living room and told our grandmother that there was someone in the bedroom, and of course she didn't believe me. Ever since that incident, I have been terrified of the dark. Even today, I tend to sleep with at least one light on in the bedroom. My wife and I have been fascinated by the paranormal since we got married. We enjoyed watching paranormal shows about ghost hunting and learning about the subject. 
we never thought we would share a paranormal experience which also involved our teenage daughter. This experience would have to do with what might have been a doppelganger. At the time, we did not know what these things were called or anything about them at all. During the early years of our marriage, we lived in a two-bedroom apartment with our daughter. It was a summer afternoon, and I had decided to go to the gym. Normally, I would be there about an hour, give or take. I'd been gone for just over 20 minutes, according to my wife, when this happened. My wife was doing some house cleaning, vacuuming to be exact, when our daughter came home from cheerleading practice. She greeted my wife and went to her room for a couple of minutes to drop off her gym bag before returning to the living room looking for me. She asked my wife where I was. My wife told our daughter I was at the gym. My daughter asked, did he just leave? And to her surprise, my wife responded, no, he's been gone almost 30 minutes. My daughter got scared and thought maybe her mom was messing with her. Don't say that, she said. I just saw him when I went to my room in the hallway. I greeted him and he answered me back. He said hey and actually passed right next to me. I felt him pass next to me and he said hello to me by name. I even had to move as he passed. My daughter said I walked into our bedroom. I never came out. My wife reassured her that I was gone and had not been back. Our daughter said she never saw my face because whatever that thing was had its head down. She said it was definitely my voice and even described what I was wearing. Our apartment had a narrow hallway that led to the two bedrooms. Hers was on the left and ours on the right. Anyone wanting to exit the apartment from the bedrooms would have to walk into the living room. After I came home from the gym and heard what had happened from my wife, I spoke with my still shaking daughter and reassured her I had been at the gym. Till this day, my daughter, whom now is a mother herself, gets freaked out about this experience. It was years later when we learned about doppelgangers. We don't know what this was, a doppelganger or something else. Whatever it was, It never happened again. Several years ago, James Bond star Roger Moore spoke openly about his own experience with the paranormal. This is his account. Sir Roger Moore said, I was frozen. I wanted to call out and scream, but couldn't speak. I was numb, paralyzed from head to toe. I was sitting bolt upright in my bed and watching a white, ghostly figure moving towards me. It was the apparition of a man. The shape of the body was clearly defined. There was a head, body, and legs, but it was mist-like. I pulled myself together, somehow, calmed myself and then tried to communicate with the ghost. I said softly, what do you want? Are you troubled? As I went to move from the bed, the ghost disappeared, just vanished. The second night of Sir Roger's stay, the apparition reappeared. He said, it returned at the exact same time, about 2 a.m. I was petrified. I thought, it's after me. What does it want with me? I tried to make contact once again, but to no avail. It vanished again. In the morning, the roommaid asked me, did you see the ghost last night, sir? I replied, good heavens, how do you know about it? No, I didn't see it last night. She said, I didn't think you would. I left the hotel, but often think about the incident. I never found out what it was all about. When I went to the room on the third night, A Bible, opened on the 23rd Psalm, was beside my bed. I hadn't put the Bible there or opened it, but that night the ghost did not appear.
I was in my early teens and had my own room at the time. I've been having some difficulties sleeping in my own bed for various reasons, and I remember having a very hard time this night in particular. I would sometimes come to my parents and stand at the side of the bed and whisper to wake them up, which scared them to death, and then trade beds with my father, who would stay in my bed. This was the case that night, I believe. It's hard to really remember the circumstances because it happened a few times, and I had taken the side of the bed nobody wanted to sleep on. That side of the bed was close to the wall, with a foot gap. It was hard to scoot into to get into bed, and it was darker on that side of the room for reasons unknown, so we avoided it. More than likely, I took that side because the bed was full and I didn't have a choice. We often saw someone standing against the wall on that side of the bed as well, and had given the shadow a name as a joke to make it less sinister, so this could have played a part in what happened. I remember choking awake. I was on my back, my hands on my chest, and I was stuck in that position. My eyes were wild because the whole room was black, I mean dark as dark could get, which was odd because we lived by a streetlight and that room never got very dark at night to begin with. So it being that dark, that black was terrifying. I couldn't see anything in front of me. There was this pressure on my chest and hands that made it difficult to breathe. I remember choking for air, thinking I had blacked out or was dreaming and would wake up. Then these two great big red eyes opened right in front of my face. No pupils, no iris, just red eyes blinking down at me. I started to make out this humped up shape of something sitting on me in the dark. It was definitely sitting on me, just looking down hatefully. I started to panic, realizing I was stuck. At this time, I'd had so many experiences that I wasn't sure if this was a dream or just another one of those experiences. And I woke up. The room was back to its usual lightness. Everything was cast in a blue night hue, and there were no red eyes. I was able to breathe again. I sat up and looked around at the bed, then I climbed over every single person laying there and ran to my room. I think that was one of the last times I ever slept in there. I have two younger sisters, but as far as I know, they didn't seem to have the same problems. I did have a couple of other episodes of sleep paralysis and started experiencing insomnia nightly. I had a routine in high school where I would sleep a few hours, wake up at 1 a.m. naturally, write until 3 a.m. and go back to bed for a couple more hours. This all started after the old hag incident. I just stopped sleeping well after that. Two men fishing in the Seneca River near Baldwinsville, New York, in June 1874, came across what appeared to be a bundle of clothes floating in the water. Closer inspection revealed that it was the body of a man, weighted so firmly that they could not drag it ashore without assistance. The feet had been tied to a 68-pound rock. Examination revealed that a second rock tied to the neck had slipped away, allowing the body to float into sight. The right side of his skull had been smashed, and the Baldwinsville medical examiner determined that the man had been murdered, but after several months in the river, his features were unrecognizable. The discovery caused much excitement in the quiet farming village of Baldwinsville. No one in the area had been reported missing, and with the body so badly decomposed, it seemed unlikely ever to be identified. Gradually, though, the contents of his pockets a tin spoon, a package of sewing needles, and a piece of calico cloth provided enough clues to determine that the dead man was Francis A. Colvin, who had boarded for a time with John Pickard and his wife. 
The spoon was from a set of nine he had purchased, six of which he gave to Mrs. Pickard and one he carried in his pocket to take medicine for his lungs. He had used the needles to attempt to sew an extra pocket into his coat. Mrs. Pickard completed the pocket for him and also added lapels to the coat. She gave him the calico cloth, part of which he wrapped around his toes to prevent chafing. An examination of his coat revealed the pocket and the lapels, and the piece of cloth was still wrapped around his toes. A dentist who had extracted teeth from Francis Colvin was able to confirm the identification. Francis Colvin had no family in the area and no friends except the Pickards. After returning from the Civil War, he had lived almost as a hermit in a shack in the woods until the Pickards offered him room and board at their house. Around December 1873, he left their house to go to work on the farm of Daniel Lindsay and had expressed his plans to move to Syracuse for a higher-paying job, so no one was suspicious when he was no longer seen around Baldwinsville. Colvin had been a hard-working and frugal man and had amassed a nest egg of about $3,000 in cash and notes, which he was known to carry on his person. It was now missing. He had held a mortgage of about $350 on property owned by John Pickard, which had been transferred to a man named Payne Bigelow. When questioned, Bigelow said he had purchased the mortgage from Bishop Vader, a farmhand who also worked for Daniel Lindsay. Vader was arrested in connection with the murder of Francis Colvin. Vader professed innocence and said that a man named Dwayne Peck was responsible for the murder. Outside of jail, Daniel Lindsay's son, Owen, was also spreading the rumor that Dwayne Peck had murdered Francis Colvin. The police arrested Peck but soon determined that he had no connection to Colvin's death and let him go. Bishop Vader was a somewhat simple-minded man. Not an idiot, the district attorney would later say, but a man that has not the moral courage to stand up and say no when one that had great influence over him shall tell him what to do. After prolonged questioning, Vader revealed that the man who'd been telling him what to do was Owen Lindsay. When Vader and Colvin were both working on his father's farm, Owen told Vader to find out how much money Colvin was carrying. Suspecting nothing, Colvin told him. Owen Lindsay then formulated a simple plan to take it. He told Vader to lead Colvin into the barn the morning of December 19, 1873. As Colvin sat milking a cow, Lindsay came up behind him and hit him in the head twice with the flat end of an axe. Lindsay went through Colvin's pockets and removed a pocketbook containing cash and notes. He gave $500 to Vader and kept $1,500 for himself. They hid the body, then Lindsay told Vader to hire a boat. If Lindsay's father asked where Colvin was, Vader was to tell him he left for the city. He gave Vader two mortgages from the pocketbook and told him to go to Syracuse, pretend to be Colvin, and sell them. Vader decided it was easier to sell them in Baldwinsville, so sold one to Payne Bigelow. When the sun went down, they put the body in a sleigh and took it to the boat Vader had rented. They put the body in the boat and Lindsay tied the rocks to it. When they reached the deepest part of the river, they threw the body overboard. After Vader had told his story, the police examined the sleigh and found bloodstains in the floorboards. They arrested Owen Lindsay and charged both men with the murder of Francis Colvin. Though Bishop Vader and Owen Lindsay were both charged with first-degree murder, Lindsay was considered the primary defendant they would be tried separately with Lindsay's case taken first. The prosecution spent the first part of the trial introducing testimony to prove that the body found in the river was that of Francis Colvin. When this was done, the principal witness against Lindsay would be Bishop Vader. Lindsay's attorney objected to Vader testifying as he was charged with the same crime. The judge heard arguments on both sides of this question then ruled that Vader could not testify against his co-defendant. The prosecution then changed the charge against Bishop Vader, 
effectively dropping the charges against him while leaving them free to charge him again later. Vader's testimony and cross-examination took more than a day and was quite damaging to Lindsay. Under oath, he told the same story that he had told the police. It also came out that Vader was left-handed and the blow to the back of Colvin's head had been delivered by someone who was right-handed. The state then introduced two college professors who had microscopically examined the blood found in the sleigh. Lindsay had contended that the stains had come from slaughtered pigs which had been carried in the sleigh. In new and controversial testimony, both professors concluded from the size of the corpuscles that the blood was from a human, not a pig. The defense challenged the date of the murder, introducing witnesses who claimed to have played parlor croquet with him on December 19th, had seen him at a birthday party, and had seen him slaughtering pigs four days after he was allegedly murdered. They contended that Bishop Vader alone was guilty of the murder and had falsely implicated Lindsay. The trial lasted ten days. After seven hours of deliberation, the jury returned a verdict of guilty of first-degree murder. Owen Lindsay was sentenced to be hanged on March 26, 1875, but the verdict was appealed, postponing the execution for nearly a year. His attorneys challenged the validity of Bishop Vader, an accomplice in the murder, as a witness. The New York Supreme Court confirmed that the criminal courts have discretionary power in this respect and let the verdict stand. On February 11, 1876, Owen Lindsay was hanged in the courtyard of the Onondaga County Penitentiary. He was urged to confess his crime, but he maintained his innocence to the end. Coming up, known to the outside world as the City of the Dead, Dargov's is a truly remarkable and mysterious place that we know little about. Plus, friends hear a crash in the kitchen, and though everything appears normal, what they eventually find is the stuff of nightmares. And a father in South Yorkshire claims his family's being haunted by the ghost of an old lady. And later, two men, a forest, an Ouija board. Will that be enough to find a rumored black-eyed child that has been seen there? These stories and others when Weird Darkness returns. No matter the time of day or season, sometimes you need to find a way to rid yourself of those ghostly chills that bring raised hairs and goosebumps to your skin. Other times you're looking for those ghostly chills. Either way, it sounds like you need a mug of Weird Dark Roast Coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee has deep notes of cocoa, caramel, and a touch of sinister sweetness that'll send shivers down your taste buds. This is an exclusive coffee that I selected specifically for you, my weirdo family. Weird Dark Roast is not available in stores, coffee houses, mad scientist labs, or even the dark web, but you can find it at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee, fresh roasted to order so it's as fresh as it can be when it lands on your doorstep and knocks three times. Grab yours now at WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. That's WeirdDarkness.com slash coffee. Weird Dark Roast Coffee does not actually knock on your door because it doesn't have arms or hands, so if you hear knocks at the door and no one answers when you ask who it is, it's probably paranormal and you should just leave the door shut and locked. A friend of mine and his wife bought a house in the south side of town about a decade ago and invited my wife and I to the housewarming party. My wife and I showed up and brought an ice cream cake and a stack of new dishes for their housewarming gift because during the move many of the dishes got broken. When we arrived, we put the dishes and the cake on the kitchen counter and the four of us went into the living room to watch a movie. The movie was a post-apocalyptic story and was really bleak, and about ten minutes in we heard a crash come from the kitchen. We all jumped, then ran into the kitchen and looked in, but we didn't turn on the lights, only used the light spilling into the kitchen from the outside of the living room 
and we could see the cake and the dishes sitting still on the table and concluded the noise had come from outside. We then returned to the living room and continued to watch the movie. Twenty minutes later, we heard an even louder crash that definitely came from the kitchen. We all ran into the kitchen and turned on the lights. The plates were still on the table, unbroken and in pristine condition. However, smeared into the icing of the cake were the words, I am in hell. My wife and I made an excuse and split. During the two weeks that followed that night, my friends heard constant crashing noises and cold spots were randomly appearing throughout the house. My friend managed to sell the house pretty quickly after that. Five years later, he did a search online regarding the house and found that it was owned in the 1950s by a vicious gangster. Known to the outside world as the City of the Dead, Dargavs is a truly remarkable and mysterious place we know very little about. Located outside the village of Dargavs in North Ossetia, Russia, this remote place is shrouded in myths and legends. Locals tell that no one has ever come back alive from the City of the Dead, and this is one of the reasons why people avoid this spooky place. However, we shouldn't forget that it also takes hours to reach the City of the Dead, and the road is dangerous. To get here, one must go through narrow roads and several hills. The City of the Dead is located in the middle of a mountain valley which stretches over 17 kilometers. The first mention of the City of the Dead dates back to the beginning of the 14th century. The city itself is an ancient cemetery where tombs and crypts are placed on hills or mountainsides closely together. The white crypts vary in size and shape. It is estimated this architectural style dates back to 2,000 years ago. Some of the crypts have ridged, curved roofs going inward in steps with a pointed peak at the top. The smaller crypts have flat sides on the front and back, yet on the sides they curve inwards, and the smallest of the crypts have no roofs at all. There are 99 different tombs and crypts. At the back of the complex there is also a watchtower, but the top of it has been destroyed. Why the Alanian Necropolis, as this place is called, was built here is unknown. Local legends and myths tell stories about plagues that wiped out entire families. According to one legend, a plague swept through Ossetia in the 18th century, wiping out 90% of the surrounding population. To cope with the disease, people had to construct quarantine houses to isolate themselves from the village, patiently awaiting their death. When they died, their corpses were left to rot inside these huts. Our historical knowledge about the City of the Dead is limited, which is the reason why we cannot fully comprehend some of the unusual discoveries archaeologists have found here. For example, scientists have discovered that several of the bodies inside the crypts are buried in ancient wooden boats. The puzzling question is why the use of boats in a place where there are no rivers? One possible explanation is that the boats have symbolic meaning. They could serve as transportation for departed souls. Perhaps our ancestors thought that the departed soul had to cross a river in order to get to heaven, and hence the boat. The concept of the souls is very old. Ancient belief about the soul can be found among many cultures worldwide, and people living in Ossetia most likely believed in some sort of afterlife. Another curious archaeological discovery revealed that there was a well in front of every crypt. It is said that once the Ossetians buried their dead, they would drop a coin in the well. If it happened to hit a stone at the bottom, it was taken to mean that the soul had reached heaven. Dead people were often buried with belongings, which shows people believed in the existence of an afterlife. I'm a bit distressed by something that's going on in my life right now. Over the past few months, I kept seeing this woman, like a face in the crowd. 
I would see her in the street, just sort of hanging around in the background. I have no idea how long it's been going on, as I'm sure I only started to notice this recently. I never saw her close up. She's always just at a distance and always just a fleeting glimpse, like out of the corner of my eye. The funny thing is that she makes me feel, well, terrified. I have no idea why she terrifies me, but she casts something of a sinister figure clothed in a dark shawl and dark clothes. At first, I thought I was simply imagining this, but now I am scared witless and I don't know what to do about it. Last night as I was walking home from the pub, a bit merry, I saw her walking just ahead of me. It froze me in my tracks and I felt that same sense of foreboding. I noticed that no matter how fast or slow I walked, she seemed to stay the same distance ahead of me. What happened next, though, really disturbed me. As I reached the door of my home, still feeling strangely afraid, I looked up the street, and there she was. Slowly she turned her head, and I saw her for the first time. She had no face. Nothing. I couldn't sleep last night. I was afraid she would show up at my doorstep or even worse in my house. Who and what is this faceless woman? Imagine waking up in the middle of the night. You can hear footsteps downstairs. You venture down the stairs and find yourself face to face with a ghost. That's exactly what happened to one man as reported in the British press. A baffled father claims his home is being haunted by the ghost of a previous tenant after catching a picture of the old lady trying to open the kitchen door. Luke Jackson is currently staying at his brother Tom's house in Sheffield, South Yorkshire, and got up for a cigarette in the early hours of November 13th when he could not sleep. The 36-year-old claims he could hear footsteps downstairs and turned on the light of his phone's camera to see what happened. But the self-employed landscaper was left stunned after taking a picture and discovering the ghostly figure of an old woman wearing a purple cardigan stood at the bottom of the stairs. After ruling out any other possible explanations, Mr. Jackson is convinced the woman he photographed is the ghost of the house's former tenant who died ten months previously. The father of three has been staying with his brother and his girlfriend, Alice Thomas, for the past few months and claims this is the first time he's noticed ghostly goings-on. He said, if I'm being honest, this thing has completely stumped me. I just don't know what it is, and the only explanation is that it's a ghost. It's almost like photographing the Loch Ness Monster in its entirety. It's the photo of a ghost that you never expect to have. You sometimes have bits of the thing, arms and legs, but never a whole photo of the entire thing. This photo is almost too perfect. After catching a glimpse of some of the documentation of the previous occupant, he is convinced the ghost is the old woman's spirit haunting the stairs. Mr. Jackson said, We've talked about this woman before. She had mobility problems, apparently, problems with going downstairs. Alice said to me that since she's had the property, she's heard banging and footsteps. The banging especially was coming from the stairs. The photo appears to show an old woman clad in a black dress and a purple cardigan leaning across in an apparent attempt to open the door. Mr. Jackson said, It must have been around 2.30 a.m. I was just sat up planning a landscaping job through in my head. I just started hearing footsteps and it was like there was something there. I was just like, that's definitely footsteps. And I used my phone as a flashlight by taking a photo. That's when I captured it. When I looked back at the shot, that figure had just appeared. This completely baffled me. Mr. Jackson added that it was fortunate he took the shot because he claims he took the clearest picture of a ghost he has ever seen. He said there's a lot of ghost videos where it's blatantly a moth flying in front of the camera 
or some kind of reflection. But this was different. You can see the photo by clicking the link to the original story in the show notes. According to a story in the Birmingham Mail, Manchester-based paranormal investigators Dale Macon and Justin Cowell of the TV series Paranormal Truth are set to venture into the forest of Canuck Chase with a Ouija board in an effort to contact the enigmatic black-eyed kid there. Filming will take place next month, and the show will air in March, apparently. Canuck Chase is a place many have described as tranquil or beautiful, a part of England where few would ever dream of finding anything out of the ordinary. It is a place of dog walkers, fishing, and natural life. It also seems to be a place of unnatural death. There have been several terrifying accounts of black-eyed children in the area, and these accounts seem to be coming more frequent. A mother and daughter were walking through Birch's Valley when they heard the screams of a young child. By all accounts, they couldn't tell if it was a boy or a girl, but the child seemed to be in distress and sounded extremely close to them. The two of them turned and ran towards the source of the scream. They couldn't find the child anywhere and stopped to catch their breath. The mother turned around and saw a girl standing behind her. The girl was no more than nine or ten years old and had her hands over her eyes. The mother asked her how she was. It seemed natural that she had been the one who'd been screaming. The girl dropped her hands slowly and placed them by her side. The mother watched in horror as the girl opened her eyes and she saw that they were completely black no iris, no white, just completely black. The mother jumped back and grabbed her daughter. The girl disappeared in a second, but the mother said that she was chased by strange feelings all day. An earlier account from Canuck Chase came from a married couple who were walking their dog. As they walked through dense woodland, they could hear the sounds of giggling, a child, by all accounts, no taller than three feet in height, appeared out of nowhere. The couple stood watching her and eventually noticed that the girl had completely black eyes. Her head was tilted to one side as though she had been hung. The couple watched as the girl stared at them for a few minutes before running away into a dense area of the forest. The interesting thing about the Canuck Chase sightings is that many of the accounts happen during the day. For those who dare to walk through the forests and overgrowth of the chase, make sure you don't travel alone. Back when I was in college, I was living in a pretty rough part of town in a very old and run-down first-floor apartment. Nothing out of the ordinary happened there for several months, until one night when I was lying on my bed watching TV. Suddenly I heard three pounding knocks on the wall behind my bed. I ignored it. It happened again and again, and I kept hearing these knocks on the wall. It was just heavy pounding, like someone was hitting the wall with both of their fists. At first, I thought it had to be some drunk outside hitting the wall. I went over to the window to see if I could see anyone. Nobody was there. The knocking stopped, so I went back to bed and tried to settle down in front of the TV. A few minutes later, it started again, only this time the knocking was on the opposite wall. This freaked me out. It eventually stopped after about half an hour. A few weeks later, this happened again while a friend was visiting. Teasingly, he said it was a ghost. I didn't think too much of it at the time, but looking back, what else could it have been? This knocking would happen off and on. Months would go by without any knocking and then it would start up again. There was no rhyme or reason to it. Eventually, I moved and haven't experienced anything since. 
sometimes I think about going back and talking to the current resident to find out if he or she has experienced anything. I work in an office building in Los Angeles. Over the last couple of years, a lot of strange things have happened in that office that neither of us, my work colleagues, can easily explain. The first strange thing happened one morning when my workmate and I were turning our computers on. She was in the lunchroom and I was in the central office when I heard her say, be right there. She came to the office and said that she clearly heard me calling her name which I know I didn't do, but we shook it off. However, this started happening on a daily basis. Sometimes it was me who heard someone calling my name. It was very strange. Then the tapping started. Both my work colleague and myself kept feeling someone tapping us on the shoulder as we worked. Sometimes the taps would last for a few seconds. Sometimes it would be a gentle touch. The phantom name-calling and tapping stopped for a long time, but something else happened. In the morning when we arrived at the office, we would find every single one of the windows open. Then, of course, there were the calls. The phone would ring in our office, and when it was picked up, there would be nobody on the other end of the line. This would happen at least once a week. These days, we're dealing with strange banging noises chairs being dragged around, computers turning off and on, but we've never seen anything. It's kind of freaky, but we're getting used to it. I just wonder who or what it is. When Weird Darkness returns, I'll have an original fictional horror story from a weirdo family member called Amoeba. Up next… There are very few among those with a love for the supernatural who don't also have a passion for Edgar Allan Poe. Poe wasn't simply a melancholy author who wrote about premature burials, sinister black cats, and talking ravens. He was much more. If you've ever read a modern mystery or horror novel, you can thank Poe. Poe invented the modern mystery story, mostly invented science fiction, and was the first writer to take the horror stories of the Gothic era and set them in modern times, starting a trend that continues today. With a lifelong interest in Poe, Troy Taylor decided to take his own look at the mysterious and macabre writer, his tragic life, unexplained death, and lingering hauntings. He invites listeners along to delve into the strange and bizarre world of Edgar Allan Poe, from his early life to his tragic marriage his insane grief, his dramatically failed career, his links to an unsolved murder and the mystery of what happened to the writer in the five days before his unexplained death. Even more than a century and a half later, no one knows what happened to Poe before he was found delirious on the streets of Baltimore, Maryland, or what killed him. Why did he disappear and then show up in an incoherent state, wearing another man's clothes? Where did he go when he vanished and who was the mysterious Reynolds that Poe whispered about in his dying breath? And perhaps strangest of all, does he haunt the mysterious graveyard where his body is buried? Nevermore, The Haunted Life and Mysterious Death of Edgar Allan Poe, written by Troy Taylor, narrated by Darren Marlar. Find a link to the book on the audiobooks page at WeirdDarkness.com. People keep on asking me what it is with me and water. I drink it, sure. Obviously, I have to in order to stay alive, but when I grab my bottle, it's when I'm severely and absolutely dehydrated and not until I reach my threshold of thirst. I know this takes a toll on my body over time, but a part of me cannot yet overcome the sheer horror I faced a few months back from the apparently 
harmless water. I am still recovering from the shock of it all, and my shrink has taken it on the top of her priority list to help me overcome my fear. The very water that sustains life has taken the very essence of it out of me. You see, it's not the water itself that I'm terrified of. It's what is inside of it. I was a university researcher a few months back, specializing in microbiology and currently on an indefinite leave from the university and my department. I doubt if I ever will be able to go back to that lab. The university took great efforts to prevent the spread of the news of the incident, and it looks like they did a good job. I think people should know for their own safety about that devilish lake, that abominable water body that cursed me for the rest of my miserable existence. While working at the university, some colleagues of mine and I came to know of this local lake, which allegedly had suddenly the clearest of all waters, all of a sudden, overnight. It didn't sound much at the beginning, but rumors and word of mouth started spreading quickly in the area with some incredible claims, like one that said you could see the bottom of the lake through the water as if looking through clear glass. This particular lake had been in the area all along, and there was nothing special about it. Locals often went fishing to this place, and teenagers used to hang around the lake perimeters having a good time with their lovers and friends. On one fateful morning, Pete and I decided to check it out ourselves, hoping that we would find something, and mostly because of our piqued interest in the lake after hearing about it almost every day for about a week now. We took our car and drove for a couple of miles before we reached the narrow, worn-down pathway that leads to the lake. It was an early morning with the weather being crisp and the sunshine welcoming and, lake or no lake, we were quite enjoying ourselves. We parked the car off the road and started to make our way through the narrow pathway. It was about a ten minute or so hike till the periphery where the ground starts to slope and the waters begin. Being early morning, there were no other people or cars to be seen and it was peaceful and quiet all around. While walking across the pathway, the evidence of recent human visitations were quite clear with crushed Coke cans, empty bags of chips, and the like. A number of people have been here in the past few days to witness the clear waters firsthand and contributed to the folklore that was building up in the community regarding this place. We reached it, and what we saw really surprised us. The rumors were not entirely inaccurate after all. The water was clear, like crystal clear, and with the sun shining down on the lake, we could see to the bottom of it, right to the numerous pebbles and swirls of mud and silt on the lake bed. This was incredible. We were thinking as to what might have happened that suddenly made the water so clear and almost transparent as if it's just not there. Did the authorities clean it up or something? I've never seen such a clean-up job ever before," said Pete. Had it not been for the breeze which made the little waves on the surface, it was difficult to spot where the water began. A thought came to my mind. I told Pete about it and he agreed. It turns out I had some collection jars in my car which, if I go back and fetch, we could take some samples of the lake water with us and test it in our lab basically just to see if we could find out what made it so clean, so clear. A harmless activity, after all, since it's just plain old water. I noticed something quite odd in the lake, though. As we could see all the way to the lake bed, it was very stark to see that there were no fish in the water, absolutely not a single one. Nor was there any plant life, either. No algae, moss, or any of those long grass-like plants that grow underwater. It was as if someone had drained out the entire lake of all forms of life that it used to host. I told Pete about this and he remarked this was very unusual and that he noticed it as well. We knew that at the very least there had to be fish as this lake was frequented by the local anglers. This odd observation made us even more determined to test the lake water, and thus I handed over an empty, sterile jar to Pete, and he crouched down and filled it up. 
Make sure you don't touch the water, I cautioned him. We hung around for another hour before heading back to the lab and also took some photographs of the lake. And yes, selfies too. Upon our return to the lab, Pete and I transferred the sample to a number of small beakers and kept them on a separate tray. The intriguing question at that point was why there was no life form to be seen. Was it because of any chemical spill? In that case, where were the carcasses of the fish and what happened to the plants? I discussed this with Pete over lunch and we decided to carry out a few basic tests. We did not have any fish specimen handy at that time, but we had tadpoles, which would do just as well. So, all being said, we started our little test. We took one of the beakers and set it up in a contained area, brought in one of the tadpoles and slowly dropped it into the beaker. The tadpole started moving about and thrashed its tail around. A minute passed and nothing changed. Pete and I exchanged glances. Then we noticed it. The tadpole was changing color. The dark brown hue of its skin was changing to a lighter shade, and it started thrashing its tail furiously, as if struggling against some unseen force. Its skin color was now rapidly transforming to a clearer form, almost translucent, and we could see its tiny bones and organs inside. We were stupefied at this and had no explanation of what we were witnessing right in front of our eyes. The horror show had not yet ended, though. In a few minutes, the whole body of the tadpole became transparent and turned into a jelly-like consistency. The organs, bones, skin, eyes, everything had now turned transparent, and the creature stopped moving shortly before that. It was now still at the bottom of the beaker, and we could just faintly make out its outline in the now still water. Pete said, it sure looks dead. Just the outline remains. Hand me the stirrer. I handed Pete the stirrer. He dipped the glass stirrer slowly in the water, and the end lightly touched the outlined shape of the dead tadpole. Doesn't feel solid, he said. Apply some more pressure, I said. Upon applying the slight extra pressure, the stirrer passed right through it and touched the beaker's bottom. The shape dissolved. The almost transparent, silhouette-like shape of the tadpole simply dissolved in the water right before our eyes. We couldn't believe what just happened and simply had no explanation. We collectively let out a worried sigh and kept staring at the beaker. There were no visible changes in the water at all. The way it looked before we had dropped the tadpole and the way it looks now was exactly the same. It's as if nothing was ever done to the water, crystal clear, with nothing in it. Or so we thought. The procedure was repeated with another tadpole and a fresh beaker, resulting in the same outcome. We videotaped the process and planned on disclosing the find to our superiors. It made sense now as to why the lake water was so clear. There is definitely something in it that is responsible for these effects on living matter something that dissolved the fish, something that obliterated the tadpoles, something ungodly. With this in mind, out came the microscope. Pete prepared two glass slides, each with a drop of the cursed water, and set them up under the microscope. On closer inspection, with enhanced resolution, we saw a shitload of unicellular microbial organisms moving about in the slide sample. That single drop was teeming with creatures. It reminded us of the amoeba, a type of single-celled organism commonly found in water bodies. Maybe it was a much more aggressive subspecies of the same thing. The amoeba were moving in rapid, jerky movements, using their flagellum in a whip-like motion. What was very unusual was that, apart from the cell nucleus, there were no other cell organelles present at least not with the current resolution of our microscope. We recorded all of these findings and compiled them to be presented to the other professors for their take on the matter. The species needed to be identified, and fast. I proceeded to transfer the beaker tray to a secure and dedicated biohazard area in the lab. I would never forget that fateful moment. The tray was in my hands and I was treading down the hallway with haste. 
I should have noticed the bunch of equipment cables snaking across the floor. But I didn't, and inevitably I tripped on it. The beaker closest to my left hand spilled some of the water on the tray and some on my clenched fist. I became terrified as the burning sensation started to gain hold, becoming intense with each second. I called out to Pete, almost screaming. Even in that moment of panic, I had to set the tray with the rest of the beakers safely on the floor and slid it under a table nearby, struggling not to lose my grip. Pete came running and didn't need to be told what had happened. He immediately grabbed a roll of tissues and approached me to wipe the stain. Gloves, Pete! Use your damn gloves! I screamed in panic, knowing what it would mean if the water came into contact with his skin. Peter realized it too and was fumbling to put them on and he threw the roll of tissues at me. My hand started to burn more intensely and no amount of wiping helped. I was losing feeling in the hand. The spot where the water made contact was now swelling and became deathly pale and blistered. It hurt like hell! I clutched my left arm with my right and held it. My left arm registered no sense of touch. I was able to move my fingers around till then, but now they were feeling stiff and immobile, almost paralyzed. Panicking, sweating, heart rate climbing, I was still trying to keep Pete informed about what the feeling was like. Then my hand started to dissolve, like those tadpoles and those fish. I was unable to move my fingers anymore and I lost all sense of my left forearm. I touched a finger with my right hand and it was squishy and spongy. I couldn't feel the bone at all. The insides of all my fingers were being turned into liquid and as my skin lost its natural color and turning more and more transparent, I saw the insides of my fingers. No bones, no blood or blood vessels, no tissue, no nothing. Everything had turned into a clear liquid with seemingly nothing inside. This hideous transformation of turning my hand to jelly now started creeping up from the fingers upwards. I vigorously shook my hand, hoping to stop the ascent, and my fingers simply sloughed off from what remained of my palm. The pain was mind-numbing, and maybe it was enough to make one lose consciousness, but with so much adrenaline rushing through me, I felt every bit of the pain right to the bone. My sloughed off fingers and half of my palm lay on the floor, looking nothing like what they originally had been. It looked like a small puddle of water someone dropped from a cup while passing. So innocuous. The freaking amoeba were eating through to my wrist now, and I felt the sting and the pain with even greater ferocity. No amount of screaming helped. My throat started to hurt. Fellow researchers heard my screams and Pete's frantic cries for help and, oh my God, and rushed to our aid. Pete screamed at them to keep distance lest someone accidentally step on a puddle and end up just like me. Half of my forearm was now gone and the swelling mass of liquid just shed itself off and fell to the floor, creating another puddle. I threw a bunch of tissues over it to keep it contained. I then realized if I was unable to stop the amoeba from climbing up my arm, it would turn my entire body to jelly and I'd end up dead, being a puddle on the floor and that too very soon. Pete, the acid, give me the acid! I yelled as loud as I could. Pete had his gloves on by then and quickly brought an unopened jar of concentrated sulfuric acid, prying it open on the way to me. Pete tore off a piece of the tarp covering equipment nearby and lay it down hastily. I lay down on the floor with my left arm stretched out and held with my right. In just a few moments, my elbow would start to dissolve. The thick, viscous acid emitted a vapor as the seal was broken, and Pete eagerly looked into my eyes for approval. I nodded. Sorry, man, he muttered, and started pouring the acid on the stump of my left arm. I saw my arm smoking, the skin turning black instantly as soon as the acid made contact. It was working. I was continuously screaming in sheer pain while Pete continued to pour the acid in order to kill the single-celled bastards. After he was done, the arm, or what remained of it, looked still and dead. There was no jelly transformation taking place anymore. The university authorities had been alerted by then and someone called 911. I wonder what the guy described to the operator. I could not take it anymore, and with the pain now greatly subsided, I passed out, unconscious on the floor.
When I woke up, I found myself at the hospital, with a huge bandage securing my once left hand. I felt dizzy and a throbbing sensation near my left shoulder. The doctor came in and informed me that they had to perform amputation from a little higher from the elbow and that there was no other option. The CDC had been alerted of the amoeba from the lake and I later learned they had cordoned off and sealed all paths leading up to the lake and armed guards were being placed to deter the curious public from the find. There was not much media coverage of the incident, and the only news report I saw just mentioned of an accident at the university. No details, no mention of the amoeba. My life has changed drastically since the incident. I have no more left hand, and I have a newfound fear and disgust of water. CDC is working closely with the university to identify the possible source of the organism. Was it some naturally occurring, previously thought extinct species that somehow resurfaced? Or was it bioengineered? Anyhow, that's all I have to say. Please shut the door on your way out. Thanks for listening. If you like the show, please share it with someone you know who loves the paranormal or strange stories, true crime, monsters, or unsolved mysteries like you do. You can email me anytime with your questions or comments at darren at weirddarkness.com. Darren is D-A-R-R-E-N. Weirddarkness.com is also where you can find all of my social media, listen to free audiobooks I've narrated, visit the store for Weird Darkness t-shirts, hoodies, mugs, phone cases, and more merchandise. Sign up for monthly contests, find other podcasts that I host, and find the Hope in the Darkness page if you or someone you know is struggling with depression or dark thoughts. Also on the website, if you have a true paranormal or a creepy tale to tell, you can click on Tell Your Story. You can find all of that and more at WeirdDarkness.com. All stories in Weird Darkness are purported to be true unless stated otherwise, and you can find source links or links to the authors in the show notes. The Drury Lane Theater is from the book 100 True Ghost Stories – Terrifying Hauntings from the UK and Around the World by Alan Toner. The Real Boogeyman is from the book Could It Be True Volume 1 – Urban Legends by Cindy Parmiter. The Horror at Pemberton Mill is from the book A Pale Horse Was Death by Troy Taylor and Renee Cruz. The Haunting of My Grandmother's Cottage, My Doppelganger, Shaken Not Scared – Roger Moore's Experience with the Paranormal, the Red-Eyed Being That Held Me Down, Tormented by a Spirit in Hell, The Faceless Specter That Follows Me, Black-Eyed Child of Kenick Chase, The Pounding Walls of an Apartment Building, The Playful Office Poltergeist, and Father Claims His Family's Being Haunted by the Ghost of an Old Lady all came from the website MyHauntedLife2.com. The Baldwinsville Homicide was written by Robert Wilhelm for Murder by Gaslight. City of the Dead is by Ellen Lloyd for Ancient Pages. And the fictional story, Amoeba, was submitted by Sabby Ray directly to Weird Darkness. Weird Darkness is a production and trademark of Marlar House Productions. And now that we're coming out of the dark, I'll leave you with a little light. Proverbs 19 verse 3 – People ruin their lives by their own foolishness, and then they are angry at God. And a final thought. Do something today that your future self will thank you for. Your actions and decisions today will shape the way you will be living in the future. I'm Darren Marlar. Thanks for joining me in the Weird Darkness. Darkness.